Christ. Hi everybody. Hello. So today um, we're going to talk about books. Uh, Zoe and I are both big readers. I've been a, a massive reader pretty much most of my life. I started reading uh, a lot from the age of 10 when we moved to Brazil as a family and uh, we spent three years there and there was no TV. We didn't even have a television for two of those years and when we did it was Brazilian TV which is fine if you speak fluent Portuguese and like watching a very hysterical Latin soap operas. <laughs> oh God, I can imagine. Where everybody's shouting at each other. I think everybody's having an affair with everybody else. So I read books. Um, you didn't have a TV when I met you. No. You didn't I, have one in Church Street, did you? I'd, I find them... No, I didn't have one in Church I didn't have one for about two or three years when I was living in Stratford. I find them a distraction. I will watch TV. Yeah. If it's there. And I do like TV Pro. There's some great stuff on. We talked about movies last time. Well, I'm sure we'll talk about box sets and stuff we enjoy watching oh, on TV. Yeah, yeah, at another time. But... I'm easily distracted. So if I've got something to distract me there, I will I will use it. So it's best for me sometimes just not to have the thing. If, you don't, if I don't have rubbish food in the fridge, I don't eat rubbish food. Yeah. And if, I, if there's not a TV there, I don't watch TV or a video game or whatever. I'm a child, He's very easily distracted. So I know that. And so if I get rid of it, it's fine. Now we've got kids, there's no way we'd get rid of a TV and I wouldn't want to now I've got a little bit more self-discipline not much but, but yeah but my so. reading has dropped off since I've become a knitter my reading's dropped off since I've been using my mobile phone more yeah it's again it's a distraction there's I've got rid of all the games on my mobile phone um, but just social media stuff like this um, checking up on editing and Mm. doing posts and I find myself easily distracted uh, by it so I can't not have a mobile phone but yeah sometimes blessing and a curse yeah so anyway we normally read for like half an hour 45 minutes before we go to bed on a really good day sometimes yeah. we stare at the page of a book and go I have no idea what that just said and turn the lights off <laughs> yeah but uh, we both love books I'm just going to move this one a little bit this is annoying me slightly there we go Okay. We're, again, we're filming this for both channels, so if it looks like we're watching a tennis match, yeah. it's just because we've got two phones. Got two phones. Um, so double the distraction. Um, so anyway, we're talking about books. Uh, we both love reading books. And, and to me, there's never been a film or TV adaptation that comes close to anything I've ever read in books. Mm -hmm. Game of Thrones, it's great. Um, Much better than the books. No, I, I, the books are still better. The books, unfortunately, never concluded. And you didn't like the books towards the end anyway. Oh, it just, it just needed some serious editing. Yeah, fantasy does. Because a lot of them are self-published, and even the ones that aren't, they're published by companies that do fantasy. They tend not to be sort of hard edited. So, mm. yeah. But I love, I like the books. Um, if he brought out the concluding books in this series, I don't know if I'd read them because it would kind of have to mean rereading the previous mm -hmm. books, of which there's, I think there's seven, and each each I, one's like a telephone directory. I got to within an eighth of an inch at the end of whatever the last book is that we own on that yeah, and gave up. Just threw it across the And room. then it occurred to me that if you're measuring books in inches, it's probably time to stop. <laughs> I think that meant I wasn't enjoying it anymore. But that's actually something you choose in a book, and especially an audio book. I meant if, you, if you're if you measuring how, how much further you've got, you've got to yeah. go before you can finish. Anyway, we're not talking about Game of Thrones. No. But um, I prefer books over film, over TV, as a general rule. Um, some things work well, like Crime Wars works quite well as a sort of film or TV adaptation. But we're here to talk about books. Yes. Um, tell me about you and books and what got you into them? I've always loved reading. Are your family are readers? Yeah. My mum is a big fiction reader. She's always got several books on the go and we kind of do swapsies. Every time we see each other, we swap carrier bags of things we left at the other person's house the last time we visited, things to read um, and newspaper clippings and jars of jam. 
Um, so I quite like that because mum has different tastes to me in what she chooses to read. I'll read anything she gives me because it's a way of forcing myself to try new things, but we have quite different tastes. You hate trying new things. I hate trying new things. Um, when it comes to reading, I've always, always read and I love it. I like fiction. I'm not, depends on the non-fiction entirely on the topic. My father, on the other hand, is only non-fiction. He um, doesn't read a huge amount, but what he does read is um, physics, and maths. physics and maths, philosophy, things like that. And I'd rather gouge my eyes out with a spoon. But yeah, we've always read. Um, I read a lot of classics as a teenager. Um, I remember joining our local library with my grandma when we just moved to Stratford when I was about eight. Grandma took me down to join the local library, which is in a, well, it's, is, it, is the library still the old library now? By Shakespeare's birthplace? It I used don't know to be a is. beautiful timbered building, and the building's still there, but I think it might be the new registry office it, now. It's right next door to Shakespeare's birthplace, and yeah. to be honest with you, tourists end up taking photographs of, of the, the library. Thing. Over yeah. the birthplace. But it's like a it's 16th century uh, building with mullioned windows. Gorgeous. Anyway, so we went in and I was, yeah, literally about eight or nine. And I remember going up to the desk with Gran and the lady behind the desk said, oh, yeah, that's no problem. Um, if you could just give me some proof of ID and your new address. And Grandma looked at me and she looked at the lady behind the desk and said, she's eight. What, what do you think she's got that's got her, her proof of address on it? Tattoos. And so I was really sad and we had to leave yeah. the library and we got about 10 metres down Henley Street and I looked at my gran and said you know the only thing I've got that's got my name on it is the label in the back of my knickers and do you know what she turned me around <laughs> and she marched me straight back in <laughs> and I joined Strapped Upon Avon local library with the name tag in the back of my knickers <laughs> yeah so yeah always always been a reader yeah. um, since the rise of well, since having the kids, I've used the library less simply because I took the kids loads to the library when they were little um, and then the council installed a massive Xbox and a flat screen TV and I spat my dummy out and refused to go back. And plus it's a pretty crappy library, our local one. It's small and it's mostly um, fairly middle of the road women's fiction, if you understand what I mean by that. Which is fine, it's just not my bag. So mostly since we got Kindles, I just I just buy books on Kindle. I do have the odd paperback book, mostly it's the ones that I swap with mum. What's your split direct between fiction and non-fiction? At the moment I'm sort of alternating. So I'll read one non-fiction and one fiction. Um And historically? A little less. Since I've started crafting I've been mm -hmm. reading more non-fiction right. so at the moment I did a, a vlog on here about some of the about knitting and crafting books I've been reading so I'll, I'll tend to intersperse those but uh, yeah otherwise generally fiction I probably read two to three fiction for every non-fiction mm. I reckon but I try to have a very broad taste mm. in all things I, I do like genre stuff so I like fantasy I like science fiction I like horror um, I like crime so even though that's all genre stuff you're already across four or five genres yeah um, but I'm yeah very broad taste when it comes to fiction my my taste is anything that is not modern day current stuff which is why I don't like fiction written for women because it's I, I live a fairly average life and I do not want to read about average people doing average things. Oh, I see. Couldn't so, give a toss. Like sort of contemporary fiction yeah. where it's talking about relationships and... I just don't care. Tell me the tax accountants. And yeah, okay. no, don't want to. But So I, I read a lot of genre stuff yeah. as well. I don't like science fiction because it's lazy and it's always aliens. And I do like historical <sighs> so, fantasy. I like... Well, I, that's not quite true. I do read modern day if it's crime fiction. Um, yeah, you read or a lot of crime. Like action adventure. Yeah, you like the Jack Reacher stuff. I love Jack Reacher. Lee Child. By Lee Child. Author. I'll read anything written by Tom Clancy. In fact, I probably have read it at least four times. Mm. But 
that's not my world. It's military exploding. Mm. And that's never been my world. And, which is almost the job of fiction. Yeah. I think for fiction, I love fiction. And I think for fiction to work properly, it has to feel very real when you're reading it. It can be preposterous, but like a good movie. In itself, it has to it, feel... It allows you to have that sense of disbelief. You know, that you can sort of... Sus the suspense of disbelief? Suspension of disbelief. Suspension of disbelief. Um, and a good fiction feels real because the characterization should feel real of the characters. Mm -hmm. And if you care for the characters, then you care for the situation that they're in. Um, so, yeah, I, I love fiction and pretty much anything... Uh, except soppy girl stuff. Yeah, 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 I'm yeah. interested. So what I've got to talk about today is the book I've just finished last night, the book that's next to read, and then two other books that kind of fit in with us all staying at home at the moment. So Zoe, what's your list about? Um, I'm. I've always got about between two and five books on the go at any one point, mm -hmm. and I sort of drop in and out of books. I'm not like that. Yeah, I, I've, I've always sort of done that um, so I'll be talking about the books I'm currently reading um, of which there's a mixture of fiction and non-fiction stuff um, I'll talk about the book I'm reading at the moment and I'll be talking about some of my favourite books okay. as well well first of all um, the book I just finished is The Binding by Bridget Collins and mine and, mine. and yours <laughs> I bought this, um, I went away with some friends in February um, and we met up in Leinster and had a wander around and a nice lunch and a piece of cake. And then we found an independent bookshop. So I picked up this and I'm not gonna lie, I was completely sucked in by the front cover. It's a very pretty front cover. It's got a key on it. Yeah, it does. Um, and it's, it's fairly newly released. I suppose it is set in the past. It kind of feels Victorian era. And um, I did enjoy it. I didn't love it. I'll be passing it on to my mum and I don't need it back. Um, I mean, just to read a quote off the back, it says, a rich Gothic entertainment that explores what books have trapped in them and reminds us of the power of storytelling. That makes it sound a bit like that Watchmaker of Filigree Street. Very similar to Watchmaker of Filigree Street, in that vein. I loved that, that was beautifully written. This is also very atmospheric. It's got a tiny bit of magic in, in the same way that the Watchmaker of Filigree yeah. Street. Just a little bit of something other. It's not wizards and spells and stuff. Um, and it follows the story of Emmett farmer he's the main character um, and the idea in this world is that bookbinders um, can remove a memory from somebody and trap it in a book so if you want to forget something um, and there's a moral issue around that is it okay are people being forced into it and how does Emmett Farmer get embroiled in it so like a book version of a pensive from Harry yes, Potter. Exactly. Okay. So I enjoyed it very much. Um, it's worth reading if you like that slightly magical thing. Um, but now I'm done. I did however get a free bookmark. Mm -hmm. I'm a bookmark person, not a doggy of the pages person. Um, I'm so one of the books I'm currently reading, uh, we were list, we were watching a just a, a very vanilla crime procedural on TV. Criminal Minds. Um, yes. And, it. Well, you know, we're watching it and every episode is basically the same. Yeah. A thing happens, the team come and solve it, next episode. But Underlying it, character storylines, barely. Barely. Um, and it's been going on forever and um, we've got quite different tastes in sort of TV and so the, the common ground is often something that's fairly beige. Mm. In a good way. Yeah. But it's, you know, it's fairly beige. Um, and it means that Zoe can keep knitting and not really pay attention to the screen. And I can be true. Uh, I pay attention. Not really. And then um, I can be in or out of it as much as I choose. Anyway, because it's a crime procedural, although it's completely made up, it does reference real crimes that have happened previously. 
and it mentioned uh, Fred and Rosemary West, which were a pair of serial killers uh, living in Gloucester. Gloucester. They're just outside Gloucester, um, and uh, they'd been at it for decades, but they got caught in the early 90s. And I remember. I, I remember well, the news coverage. I remember it as well, but I couldn't remember anything about it. And at the time, I would have been 2021, 20, I think I was still in the Marines, and it sort of happened, and we're like, oh, well, that's bad, but whatever. I never read into it. I never knew anything about it. So I downloaded a book on the Kindle, um, which, is called, which is called Fred and Rose, uh, and it sort of looks at them. Is it by? Oh, good question. It's by Howard Souness. Uh, so Howard Souness. And um, he was a journalist for the, I want to say the Mirror, um, and he covered it at the time. And he, through his covering of it and interviews, he had access to members of the West family, um, members of Rose's family, police that were on um, mm -hmm. the inquiry, the whole thing. And, I mean, there's a whole massive genre of true crime out there. And I'm not a true crime fan because, no. to be honest with you, it's horrible. But I'm also a person that likes to sort of fill the gaps in my knowledge. So it, once I've got something in my head, I kind of want to look it up. So I read this book and I've pretty much finished it now. They've been caught. It's at trial. Fred's dead. Spoilers. Um, <laughs> I think it's and, not a spoiler uh, if that many years ago. <laughs> uh, and uh, Rose is about to get sent down. Um, so, like, all the murders have happened. And it was staggering. Mm. But a lot of it could have been stopped because he was on the radar from the 1960s as being the sort of person he was. But because there was no communication between the social services, childcare services, um, spousal abuse type services, the police, uh, he just went unchecked and the whole thing could have been nipped in the bud a long time ago. He was just a nasty, evil person. Um, like a lovely bedtime read. Yeah, but really interesting and it's sort of filled gaps in uh, something I didn't know anything about. So that's one of the books I'm reading at the moment. I'm nearly finished. My next on the list is um, one that my mum gave me. And this is called The Snow Child by Eowyn Ivy. There'll be one at the back. Um, she gave this to me before, before Christmas. I think it was last autumn. And I wanted to read it over winter. Um, but that didn't happen. Um, you not start it yet? No, literally oh, this is going to be tonight's... Um, tonight's read. It's set in the 1920s um, and I must confess I don't know a huge amount it, about it. Um, Jack and Mabel have staked everything on making a fresh start for themselves in a homestead at the world's edge in the raw Alaskan wilderness. Mm. But as the days grow shorter Jack is losing his battle to clear the land and Mabel can no longer contain her grief for the baby she lost many years before. Um, eventually they end up building a snowman together and the next morning all trace of her has disappeared and Jack can't quite shake the notion that he glimpsed a small figure, a child, running through the spruce trees in the dawn light. So I think this is going to fall again into that a tiny bit of magic but not fantasy genre. Um, fantasy light. It's had fantastic reviews. It was a Sunday Times bestseller. Um... So I thought I'd give it a go. Yeah. Um, most of my books, I'd, I'd love to be able to show you the covers of my books, but nearly all the books I'm reading currently um, are on the Kindle. But one yeah. I am Comrade's got my Kindle re at the moment. reading at the moment is this, which is given to me by my friend uh, David Rich. Uh, it's called Factfulness. It's called <laughs> Factfulness. Uh, and it is by Hans Rosling. Or Rosling. And um, it's a non-fiction book. I shall read a little blurb on the back for you. When asked simple questions about global trends, what percentage of people around the world are living in poverty, or why the global population is increasing, or how many girls actually finish school, we systematically get the answers wrong. So wrong that a chimpanzee choosing answers at random will consistently outguess journalists, Nobel laureates, and investment bankers. And in this book, he goes 
into the actual facts behind a lot of the stuff that we just assume is real. World poverty is a terrible thing. It is. That's not what it's saying. But it's far less. It's much slow, smaller percentage actually provable fact than it actually is. In so this is this sort of focused on media presentation of facts or how we absorb the information? Um, that's a, I don't know. This is my book to start. Oh, okay. So I, I don't know. Dave, Dave Rich and I had many long talks about this book. I can see and why it so, appeals to him. Yeah, he's <laughs> um, yeah, very interested in politics and very interested in economics. So I'm going to be interested in this. So that's what I'm going to be reading next. That might be one that my dad would like. Maybe. I'm sure he'd enjoy getting himself in a froth about it. Yeah, so um, in Factfulness, Professor of International Health and Global Ted Phenomenon, uh, Hans Rosling, together with two long-time collaborators, Anna and Ola, offer a radical new explanation of why this happens and reveals the ten instincts that distort our perspectives. So it sounds like it's more on how we interpret misinformation. Okay. And how that misinformation sort of starts in the first place. And I think it's to do with facts that were true a long time ago mm -hmm. that have just sort of held, been held over now. Like, butter is bad for you, for example. Fallacy. Yeah. You know, the high Don't fat, eat eggs if you want Don't to lower your carb yeah, yeah. You know. One egg, more than one egg a week, you're gonna, your heart cheese will explode with hardened cholesterol. I love eggs. So that's what I'm reading next. Huh. Um, two books I've read in the past, but the one that's sort of relevant to everyone staying home at the moment. Um, the first one is called The Victorian House by Judith Flanders. Now, I think this was a book that was recommended to me back in the days when we used to have time to read the Sunday Times. God. I know, um, that, that must be like the late 90s. <laughs> I, I, I think, when, when was Conrad born? 2004. It was around about 2003 we stopped doing that. Yeah, probably. Um, and why it appealed to me the first time round is because when we moved to Cardiff into our first home together, I spent the first year in halls of residence at university um, and then we moved into a terraced house. South Wales, Cardiff in particular, experienced a huge boom during the Victorian era. Um, the Butte family, the local lords of South mm. Glamorgan or whatever they were, were uh, hugely involved in industry, obviously coal mining, but also shipping. Um, and alongside that industry had to be fast housing for the workers. So I'm sure if you're UK based, you know exactly the sort of terraces I'm talking about. They're nice, don't get me wrong. They've all got a, a small back garden and they were sort of two up, two down. Most of them have had an extension for a kitchen and a downstairs bathroom now. Um, very common, very common where we are. And this book talks about Victorian life on a room by room basis. So obviously when it talks about the kitchen, it talks more about the domestic staff. Um, and when it talks about the nursery, it will talk about child rearing, child care. Um, dining room is obviously more to do with um, entertaining and sort of social graces and things like that. Um, it's got quite a few nice colour pictures in it, um, mostly of um, Victorian artwork around domestic issues and also photographs of sort of stately homes and things like that. Um, so because we were living in a terrace at the time, I found it very interesting um, to sort of see how it digresses. Um, so yeah, that's well worth a read. And the other one, I do love Bill Bryson. Um, he's an American, originally from, I don't know how you say it, Des Moines? Des Moines? Des Moines. Des Moines, Des Moines. in Idaho. Um, and he's hilarious, but he's lived in no, the no, UK for a long time. Iowa. Iowa. Yeah, it's not in Idaho. Okay. Iowa. Iowa. Des Moines. I I Iowa. Sorry. Um, so I've read or listened Just to almost everything he's like written. South of Chicago, basically. Oh, okay. That's cold. Um, so a lot of what he's written has been an American's view of living in the UK, which is hilarious. Um, but this one is about... A home. 
Um, and again, he goes through it, through his own house. He ended up living in a Georgian rectory, I think. Um, but his is a lot, his goes a lot further. The, the other book is more to do with just domestic issues. And this encompasses an awful lot more. Almost like the history of the kitchen. Yeah. How it sort of changed over the years. So it says, um, a lot of the key discoveries for humankind can be found in the very fabric of the houses in which we live. This inspired Bill Bryson to start a journey around his own house, an old rectory in Norfolk, wandering from room to room, considering how the ordinary things in life came to be. Along the way, he did a prodigious amount of research on the history of anything and everything, from architecture to electricity, from food preservation to epidemics, from the spice trade to the Eiffel Tower. And, although, and he discovered, although there may seem to be nothing as unremarkable as our domestic lives, there is a huge amount of history, interest and excitement, and even a little danger lurking in the corners of every home. So he expands his out a lot further into greater society and technological innovation, um, but he's also very funny. I'm not allowed to read Bill Bryson in bed because I snort all the time with laughter and it makes him cross because I have to read the bits out loud to him and then he doesn't think they're funny. Context. So yeah, I thought these two just kind of fit in to us having to make a different sort of home life at the moment. Um, yeah, can well, highly recommend them. This one is a little more in depth. That one's a lot funnier, but they're both really, really good. Um, so books I am also reading at the moment um, are well, one I've just finished, which is called Under the Eagle by Simon Scarrow, and it's a his historical. Uh, fiction about the Romans and the invasion of Britain. What did the Romans ever do for us? Um, um, so uh, the basic story is that there are there's a centurion and he's got a young Optio, uh, which is sort of second in command, who's very inexperienced, uh, and they are plunged into danger and intrigue and skullduggery. And they're involved in the second invasion of uh, Britain under Emperor Claudius. The first one was under Julius Caesar, which happened. This I think this one happens about fifty years later. Uh, and in it, there's also a bit of a treasure hunt, and uh, there's sort of various government machinations going on with the struggle of power back in Rome. It's very much in the vein of uh, Bernard Cornwell. Mm. If you've ever read any of his stuff, like the Sharp stuff, it feels like yeah. that. Lots of interesting facts, but it's definitely adventure fiction. And I, I finished that one recently. That was very good. I'm currently reading uh, the second in a trilogy of books, which are called The Mistborn. And uh, this is my second or third time round reading these. Who's it by? The author is Brandon Sanderson. And uh, he's just fantastic. He's about the best fantasy writer out there, more or less. Him, Joe Abercrombie, who we'll talk about yeah. later. Um, and uh, Brandon Sanderson, um, it, this particular series, the Mistborn books, the three in the main series, and then there's some spin-off ones. Um, this is the second one, which is called The Well of Ascension. Great stories. Um, very clever magic system, how it works. And if you are a little bit nervous about fantasy being heroic barbarians and loincloths killing things with swords and that's it, this is definitely a book I'd recommend because it goes in much cleverer. Uh, and this particular series of books is how you overthrow a government. And it might read those. They sound good. They're very good. Very good. Um, and that's kind of what I'm reading at the moment. There's another one that I keep picking up and putting back down again called the Raw Shark Tests. Basically, I'm playing the words from Raw Shark Tests, which is a sort of, you know, the inkbox yeah, yeah, yeah. thing. Um, that it comes very highly recommended, but I, I haven't made the commitment yet. Um, I've got two other things I want to talk about, which are my favourite books. But what would you say your favourite books are to ever, but also to reread? I think I'd have to pick two series. The Joe Abercrombie, um, Logan Nine Fingers, what's the title? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm going to talk about that one as well, so we may as well. So Joe Abercrombie is a British fantasy author, and he, he made his 
name with the first law trilogy. Yes. Three books, uh, which I want to test my memory. Um, Blade itself. The Blade itself. Um, before they are hanged, mm -hmm. and the last argument of kings. Brilliant. Okay. Brilliant book. <sighs> it's fantasy, but it's not ludicrous, overblown things. No. And the main character, well, the, all the characters are real people. There's like, if you think if you read a fantasy book, no one ever swears. But if no. you were a load of barbarians charging around killing people, you'd be effing and blinding all over the place. So I, yeah, I reread those fairly regularly. Yeah, they're fantastic. Um, Very violent. Uh, the swearing, the sex in it, so it feels real. The, the magic in the world is almost non-existent. But brilliant adventure story. Everyone, I reread those everyone's, a lot. everyone's a bastard. Like, there's nobody good and evil. It's not black and white like in standard fantasy stuff. Mm. Everybody's a bit of a git. Yeah. He's very funny at times. And he wrote another one, um, Best Served Cold. I loved. Which what, is a my favourite. Which is adjacent. Yeah. Put it that way, and I I enjoyed it. But not as much as the others. Yeah, he's written a bun bunch it. of other books. So Best of Cold. Um, yeah, the Heroes, Red Country. are uh, All three yeah. books set in the same world. He's done a trilogy of kids' books, which are very good. Half a King, Half a War and Half a Something yeah. Else. Half the trouble that. with Kindles, and that's yeah. we've got them on our Kindles, is you never see the front cover. So I can know... When someone says, what are you reading? Like, I've got no idea what it's yeah. called. So Joe <laughs> Crombie, The First Law Trilogy... Yeah. Probably um, you and I favourite yeah. books. Um, Lee Child, Jack Reacher books. I will reread endlessly. There's mm. loads of them. I forget what happened every time, and it's a comfort read. If I don't want to make a decision at ten thirty at night on what to read, I'll just read Jack Reacher. Tom Clancy for you as well. And Tom Clancy, yeah. Yeah, I, I've read a lot of the Tom Clancy stuff. Uh, really enjoy them. Uh, for me, growing up, the, the books that first seized my imagination as a young teenager were Stephen King books. Uh, anything by Stephen King. Uh, he, he is a phenomenal author. He is. He's very good. Um, and uh, he's written across genres. He's well known, of course, for his horror, so as being his main thing. But what, what I think he's fantastic at is his characterization. Mm. The people feel real. And the two books that have sort of stuck with me out of his the longest are his longest books, which are The Stand which are very pertinent to today's we're living in now, because it is about an infectious disease um, that spreads around the world. Um, and uh, It, uh, which we're probably familiar with with the recent movies. And the book is like that. It's 900 pages, incredibly dense. But I remember being sad when the book finished because I was going to miss the characters in the book. Yeah. Like, they felt like my friends. I yeah. spent so long time with them. So, yeah, anything by Stephen King growing up. I don't read it so much anymore. I think growing up, I read a huge amount of classics. So Jane Austen, I'll happily reread Pride and Prejudice, um, Sense and Sensibility. wasn't a fan of it ever so much. Um, but, yeah, a lot of Austen. Yeah. So, yeah, those are my kind of favourite books, I think. Um, other stuff was important for me at different times. Like, a lot of kids, I really got into Lord of the Rings. Mm. I don't need to reread it ever again. Uh, I just don't. Um, and there you go. There you go. So that's books and what we've read, um, what we're going to read next, and what we're currently reading. Um, and if you've got any recommendations for us based on the sort of stuff you've heard us talk about, mm. let Pop us know them down below. below. Yeah. And maybe we'll do another one on box sets. Yeah, or anything else you can think of. Top five, anything list. you can think of. Love yeah. Who we all have a list. Anyway. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.